and then we'll you know uh, make sure people have time to get in. So let me uh, start with the intro. Hi, <laughs> I'm David Choi, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Director of the Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship at LMU. I'm here with uh, Darlene Fukuji, who is hiding in the back doing all the work. She's the Associate Director of the Center. Um, I'm here with Dale Ardeen, and also, of course, uh, Jason. I uh, would like to welcome everyone to the Connor Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series. We're excited to welcome Jason Wilk, one of our own, CBA class of 2007, co-founder and CEO of Dave.com, <clears throat> as our, in case you don't know this, 65th Conrad Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur. For those people in a webinar who may be less familiar with Dave, just a few words before you talk about it, Jason. Um, sure. Number one personal finance app in the US with, are you close to eight, seven or eight million users? About eight now. About eight now, right? That's what I suspected. <laughs> All the numbers are over seven. You're valued to be in the billions of dollars. What I really like is you're also ranked as one of the best startup employers in the country, according to magazines like Fortune Magazine, Statistica, Built in LA, and so on. And so many, many rankings, right? So our talk today will be in Q&A format. I'm gonna start asking some questions and we'll have some time for uh, the audience to ask questions. Audience, please use the uh, Q&A function provided by Zoom and Darlene will read them out to us later uh, in the program. So Jason, again, welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Dr. Joy. Great to be here. So, you know, my goal is um, that um, we reveal all of your secrets, secrets of success uh, with everyone on this webinar in the next 60 minutes. Is that okay? Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, I want to ask you, as a student, you used to uh, enjoy coming to speaker events uh, at LMU. How does it feel all of a sudden to be the featured speaker? Uh, I can't believe it, to be honest. It feels really great to, to sit here uh, over a decade later as one of the featured speakers. That series is something I remember pretty dearly uh, is, is sparking my interest in entrepreneurship at an early age. Um, I, I will never forget those. One of them being the, uh, the CEO of Public Storage. Oh, yeah. I believe was, uh, was one of the ones I, I saw. And the way he was describing how he built that company and uh, the process that he used to come up with the idea, just it, it didn't seem crazy to me uh, to build a company of that size and scale. He found a, a product market fit that, that customers needed. He built a great team around it and was able to scale the company. And I thought that was, uh, you know, it was really inspirational, even though it was a very simple message. Yep. So we're going to talk about product market fit and what you did in college. But uh, for us to understand your even earlier background, and to ensure to everyone that you're not from outer space because of your outrageous track record as an entrepreneur, I think it's uh, fantastic. So please tell us in about a couple minutes uh, about your background, you know, where did you grow up? What did you do when you were little or in high school and how did you end up at LMU? Well, I grew up in Agora Hills, California. So I, I didn't venture too far away to college. Uh, it, Growing up, my passion was golf and music, and I ultimately wanted to be a professional golfer. And LMU was on a, on a short list of schools willing to accept me into a Division One, mm -hmm. Division One program, and I was lucky enough to play on the golf team at uh, at school. I was, I think, one of the worst golfers in the history of of uh, of Loyola as far as my scoring average goes. <laughs> As uh, my last couple of years of school, I, I definitely started to shift more towards my focus on entrepreneurship and uh, taking more an in interest in, uh, in business from golf. But uh, it, was, it was what really led me to the school and uh, it was a, you know, a wonderful experience for, for the four years. So at LMU, you got, start, you got started in a uh, startup. And I think your first one was something called One Day Sport, right? Yes. You just started in college. 
Would you talk about One Day Sport and uh, what it was? And and I think you ended up selling it in around 2008. That's right. So that idea came when I was in uh, my study abroad, actually. I was doing uh, the, the, the exchange program in Beijing. And while I was out there, my focus was, given it was my first time not having to pay so much attention to golf, I really wanted a goal of starting a business while I was over there. And the idea was that uh, I really love this website called root.com, which was this early site from the 2000s, which would highlight a one electronic product for the day. And for 24 hours, they'd offer some crazy deal until it sold out. And if you didn't buy it that day, the next day it was another brand new uh, offer. And so I thought, given my knowledge of golf, that there was this real opportunity to offer people a product that was at least six months off the shelf or even, even older, but offer that at a really steep discount. And so I started this company called One Day Sports which took the same model where we'd offer one golf product at the lowest price in the country for 24 hours. And if you didn't buy it that day, it was gone forever. And so it really created a sense of urgency to want to log onto the site every day. And through this sort of flash sale model, we we're able to gain a lot of traction. One Day Sports was uh, one of the very early players in this daily deal space and ultimately um, ended up selling the company way too early it was enough money to travel the world and figure out what I wanted to do next. But that industry ended up exploding after, uh, after I graduated and that, you know, the rise of Groupon and, um, you know, tons of these other companies that built multi-billion dollar businesses in that same exact model. So, you know, too early, but a good lesson that if you really stick to an idea and are willing to have passion around it long enough that, you know, you will, you will see your, your time. You know, you mentioned uh, travel. I remember we were connected on Facebook for, I don't know, 12 years or whatever, but uh, I remember you do travel a lot, right? You have a lot of pictures from a lot of different places. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to talk about the uh, 145, but you also got involved in another business, uh, a Ridey Board. You, it was called initially uh, Whitey Board. How, yeah. And you got involved with that with a couple of LMU alumni also. That's right. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and how you got involved with that business? Yeah, that one was, uh, you know, a, a friend, this, this guy, Sachi, he, he was a, another student of yours, Dr. Choi, and he yeah. was in love with going to the library and, you know, writing uh, all these different option equations on these whiteboards. And he really wanted to bring a whiteboard to, to his house, but yeah. these things were like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So he was trying to figure out how can we, you know, get some kind of cheaper version and I had just really, you know, ended my study abroad. I was a little bit out of school and I thought maybe I could email my connections over there to figure out if we could make some kind of, my idea was to make, take some kind of a sticker and then have these guys make a much bigger machine. And I found a manufacturer that was producing these little Disney uh, stickers that had the ability to, to write and erase. And I said, could you guys make us a four by six foot version of that? So they retooled the machine and figured out how to do it. And I helped set up the whole business and, and funded every, uh, every dollar of it, brought in investors to it as well, and then let that company kind of sail off onto its own. So early co-founder, helping to get it off, off the ground for sure with uh, some, some smart guys. I remember Sachi coming to my class and saying, hey, Professor Choi, I got to take two weeks off. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and he says, uh, he's got to go to Hong Kong and uh, work with a manufacturer. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably the uh, the company you introduced him to. So, um, and then the company that you spent a lot of time on right after college, uh, or a little bit after college, was a 140 Fire that became All Screen. Right. Yep. Now this one you spent uh, uh, some number of years on. So please tell us about the original idea of All Screen, and then uh, I think you did a lot of pivots as well. So a lot of interest interesting story there. Yeah, I'm always coming up with different ideas. And at that time, I was trying to figure out, you know, anything interesting to work on. I, I, I had that small amount of money from the sale of, of One Day Sports. And sort of in between that, I was just writing about my favorite startups on a, on a blog that I had, which was a really fun way for me to sort of stay in, in tune with the industry. It got me invited to a bunch of tech conferences. And so I was able to start uh, meeting various folks and founders in, in the area. And 
I had an idea that I was certainly not passionate about, but I thought would be a pretty cool thing, which was called 140 bets. And the idea there is that uh, there's so many people that are betting on, on sports every week. And I figured if you could create uh, some sort of version of Twitter where people could tweet out their stock picks and you could monetize your followers if you're good at picking your stocks, we could kind of publish your track record. So if you're great at, at, at betting on the, uh, the LA Rams or on something on baseball, uh, somebody would want to pay to follow their, uh, your picks. And so that was the idea. And the, the process of, of starting that business really was, I, I had met through my blogging days, I met Mark Cuban randomly at this conference. And Mark was the keynote speaker at the Tech, TechCrunch conference I happened to be attending. And he was on stage talking about the five ways that he would invest in a startup. And at the time he was really investing in, in nothing. He had a couple of angel investments. This was years before he, he joined Shark Tank, but he was this multi-billionaire and you know, outspoken NBA owner. And so everyone was really attracted to hearing him speak. So I was the only writer in the room that, that, uh, that took advantage of this talk and, and wrote an article called The Five Ways to Get Mark to Invest in Your Company. One of the ways he said to, to get him to invest was to email him. And he gave the entire audience his email address, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. So I published the article that, that evening and it ended up getting a lot of traction on, uh, on Dig and on, on Hacker News. And I emailed it to Mark. And I just so happened to see him at the, the cocktail reception later that evening. And amongst the, the mounds of people trying to get to meet him, I walked up to him and told him I wrote this article. And he said he, he actually checked his email. He, he saw it. <laughs> he really appreciated it. Yeah. And I told him that I was thinking about starting a company and it'd be so great to work with him. And he said, you know, look, keep in touch. And so I did. And for a year, I emailed him various ideas around stuff. And, he generally shot down every every idea I had, including this this one uh, this this betting idea. But also through those blogging days, I met one of the uh, early founders involved with, with something called Y Combinator, which I had never heard of. It was a brand new program, and these founders I knew, which were the, the founders of Airbnb and uh, of Dropbox. They this is back in two thousand eight. You know mm -hmm. they where it had such great things to say about this, this startup incubator that introduced you to investors. And so it was once I got into that, that I emailed Mark and I said, hey, I got into this prestigious accelerator. It's called Y Combinator. I'd heard of it. And he said, well, you know, now I'm ready to invest. And so it was sort of through that process that uh, I was able to convince him that, you know, I was an entrepreneur that was worthy of so, some kind of Silicon Valley money. And that was really a life-changing event for me, both going through that program and getting Mark to put money in. Because in 2007, 2008, the startup scene in LA was really, there, there was none. Uh, right. It was incredibly challenging for me. The best offer I ever had from an angel investor down here was a $50,000 check to start a company, which you know is, is, is not much. Yeah. So you started the business. Uh, I mean, you, you, you ended up launching it with uh, Y Combinator, but I remember you went through a lot of uh, pivots. Yes. This business. And that being almost be a different kind of company, right? Uh, it was an incredibly different business from where we started to where we ended up. But it was a consistent perseverance of trying to find product market fit with something. I mean, we were, my co-founder and I, we were sleeping on couches. Mark specifically capped our salaries at $30,000 a year <laughs> until we actually got the business to be profitable. Uh -huh. And he, he did stick to that. So we did not have much money to, uh, to work with. And ultimately the, the betting idea didn't really work. We then decided that uh, we were gonna make more of an interactive game and call it 140 Fire. And mm -hmm. that was gonna be centered around live sports. So mm -hmm. you could bet on kind of, or have an engagement of if Tom Brady's gonna make this next pass or if someone's gonna make, make the next field goal. So kind of, you know, be very engaged with these live events. Well that didn't work uh, very well either. Mm -hmm. uh, so much to the point, we actually, alongside Mark Cuban, uh, the Kraft family was also investors in our, our very first round. Mm -hmm. And uh, they only gave us a, a $50,000 check. But one of the mandates of, of getting his money was he wanted us to fly out to the stadium and meet him in person to talk about the idea. Mm -hmm. And so we got to meet in person with, uh, with the Crafts. 
and Jonathan specifically, the, the son who really is, was running the show, uh, even though he was the one driving the investment, he ended the meeting telling us that our idea was, was not very good and that it probably was not going to work. Yeah. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I, I think it's going to work. I said, why don't we ask someone else in the organization? And he called up his head of business development for the Patriots and said, do you think this is a good idea? Have you heard of this 140 fire company? He said, yeah, I've heard of it. I think it's cool. I think it, I think it could work. And Jonathan said, famously, would you put your job on the line for it? And the guy said, well, no, I'm not going to put my job on the line. Of course not. <laughs> and so Jonathan's like, you see, I told you so. It's not a good idea. Anyways, so we, we, we flew back uh, to LA. That idea didn't work out. And somehow we figured out that um, it would be a good idea to try and sell the same technology to advertisers because we're like, hey, we have this cool overlay, this cool technology to let people engage and pull on stuff. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could help make advertising better because right now you watch a 30 second commercial on TV and it's, it's a boring experience. In the early to mid 2000s, we're seeing the rise of sort of these online uh, video ads on YouTube and on all over the web. So we figured why not add cool like polling and engagement to those ads. So we partnered with Coca-Cola, luckily, in a partnership, and we ran an ad over one of their Coke ads that said, uh, what's your favorite Coke? And it had an explosion of engagement. And it was like over 50% of people who watched the ad actually polled on which was their favorite Coke. So it was like un unheard of type of uh, engagement for, for typical advertising. Mm -hmm. So then we spent a couple of years going to advertising agencies, really trying to sell in this technology. And even though we had this amazing uh, results, it was such a age old industry of mm -hmm. kickbacks and uh, all kinds of tactics from big companies with huge sales teams. And we just could not compete. We finally found reprieve in that the technology that we had was useful for uh, media companies like CNN and uh, MTV and Nickelodeon and all these guys who wanted to have more things to sell their advertisers. And also they wanted more ways to drive more viewership of their videos. And that ended up being the business we ran with for, for years. And it became a, an Inc. 5000 uh, top 50 company. We got the thing to 20 million of revenue. We had almost 7 million of, of cash flow in the final year that we sold it. Um, and we never raised more money than that initial seed round from Mark and Y Combinator and, and the crafts. So it was, a, it was an awesome uh, experience of, of true, true grit to get to where we ended up, ended up getting to. And we never wanted to give up. We just had faith that we were going to finally get the right model. Uh, that, that's a great story. So how long did it take you from, I don't know, when you started, I don't know exactly when you started, till you thought you had the right business model figured out? So we got the, the team together in uh, roughly September of 2009. And I don't think we actually quite figured out the business model until 2013. Oh my so gosh. It was, <laughs> it was a, a long time. We you know, made little amounts of money okay. through the various projects we were trying to do. And yeah. YD Board certainly helped keep me afloat uh, during that time for, for, yeah. for, some, for some needed uh, salary. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a long process. But so did you during that process ever get discouraged and think, man, this is not going to work out? No, I never did because ultimately I had a, a, an amazing relationship with my co-founder who was like mm -hmm. a brother to me. And we mm -hmm. developed this in, incredible partnership over, over the years. We, uh, you know, in our free times, we would play tennis together. He would go on vacations with my family. He's best friends with my fiance. And, you know, we, we truly enjoyed the, the, the hard work of, of trying to figure out what, what the right idea was going to be. Money was not, was not, we didn't need a lot of money. We kept our burn rate personally very, very low. Mm -hmm. And so it afforded us the luxury of time to figure out our idea. Wow. Yeah, we, we were quite fortunate and then we took the approach we did of not raising outside venture capital that would have put a lot of pressure on the business to succeed. And so we were kind of afforded on our own luxury to take our time to, to build the business that we wanted. Well, yeah, I thought that maybe during that process, you might've gotten a little discouraged, but it's, uh, you must have some inner strength uh, or, or positive thinking. I don't know what, what, whatever worked for you. <laughs> well, I think golf certainly helps. I mean, it's such an up and down sport. 
Yeah. It's such a challenge to play competitive sports, especially individually. And so I think part of that is, you know, realizing that it's a, it's a daily, it's a constant grind to, to improve and it's not always perfect and you have to deal with those ups and downs. And we certainly had a lot of them, but it ended up, ended up working out. It was a life changing event for, uh, for myself and, and for my co-founder. Yeah. We can mention the sales amount, right? I think it's in the news already, right? Yeah. 85 yeah. million off of a $300,000 seed check. So it was a, it was a, no, an no amazing. Mark Cuban likes you even more now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah, that, was, that was a good sale i remember you facebook messaged me uh, afterwards yeah and uh you stayed with the company i think for 15 months or after the acquisition or something like yeah, that that's about right okay and then um and then you started this incredible company which we are finally getting to uh called dave uh which you seem to have started around 2017 is that about right or was it earlier Got the team together in 2016. So it was like almost, we took a two week vacation after we finished our, our uh, work at the, at the last company and then went right into to starting Dave and building the foundation for that. For those of us in the webinar who may have been under a rock for the last few years, could you explain what Dave is and uh, what it does? Yeah, Dave is a, a mobile bank that helps the average American uh, have a better banking experience. You know, we were truly are on a mission to greatly improve the cost, usability, and accessibility of the legacy banks, which never worked for me as, a, as a, you know, someone in my 20s. Banking was always just completely broken. I was always hit with overdraft fees, especially with my, my low salary from, from Mark Cuban, understanding what bills I needed to get that, that were coming up until my paycheck date, constantly asking friends for 40, 50 bucks to fill my gas tank or go out to dinner or something like that. I just felt like you could build an experience that, that, that people really needed. Uh, the, the whole mantra of white combinator, which we learned a lot in those early days was to, to build something that people want. And banking was clearly something that people needed. Totally. Yeah. It's an industry that hasn't changed much, but at this time you're already wealthy. You know, you, you probably weren't uh, suffering from overdraft fees but just so you're relating to your own experience from the earlier days? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I keep this laundry list of ideas I think are, are worthy to work on and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next for, for the, the, the next business. I really wanted to go after a major industry and consumer finance with a lot of the early invention of these tools that allow you to connect to people's bank accounts. There's a lot of these banking as a service products that allow you to offer some of these these financial tools like offering a debit card and true bank accounts for people. The tools were there to start a disruptive company. What I felt was really missing in the market was the right marketing angle to, and the right brand that was really, uh, was people were waiting for. And so instead of just launching a, a new type of consumer bank, we started with a product called Dave, which helped people avoid overdraft fees. And the reason we started there is because reading Reddit, reading all the, all the popular social, social sites, the biggest thing that people are complaining about with their bank is overdraft fees. $34, you get hit with these things and it, it adds up. And I certainly was one that, that uh, was a victim of hundreds and hundreds of dollars per year of these, these fees. So I felt like if we started there, we could really build a relationship with customers. And from, from there, you could really sell them into to wanting to, to open up a bank account. And that's so where we, we started. So from the very beginning, you, 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 meant, you meant to get into the banking industry, not just solve this overdraft uh, problem. That's right. That was always the plan. But I, I generally believe that people don't wake up in the morning wanting to open up a new checking account. It's just not that attractive of, uh, of a proposition to go set something up. Mm -hmm. But if I could offer instant relief of an overdraft fee for you and help alert you about upcoming bills, that would be a great way to establish a financial relationship with somebody and then say, hey, how about this no free, no fee checking account um, from Dave? And that just happened to work out very, very well. We can acquire millions of users uh, with, uh, with, with both different avenues. You know, it's interesting. I mean, we, we know banks make tons of money from overdraft fees, $35 billion or something. Uh, but, uh, and we just uh, didn't do anything about it until, until you did. Yeah. That's uh, right. I mean, yeah. we, we really did invent uh, an industry. I mean, we're now seeing that there's lots of these new 
pop-up kind of challenger bank, some valued incredibly high as well, that mm -hmm. they now offer a Dave type product of a free cash advance to uh, get yourself gas, groceries, and everyday essentials. And that's now table stakes in the industry. And, and Dave invented that almost four years ago now. Yep. So I think this is going to be a good lesson. So when you, when you were testing this, uh, did you build an MVP like uh, we, we teach students that they're supposed to, or how did you uh, test it and how good was your MVP or how minimal or complete was your MVP? It was pretty minimal. I mean, we, we did have a, we obviously had a, a, a great brand we built out, mm -hmm. but the product was incredibly simple mm -hmm. and that you could connect any checking account. So come to us with a Chase or a Wells account, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And within seconds, we can predict your, predict a few bills for you mm -hmm. and also offer you a uh, hundred dollars of, of a cash advance for free. Yeah. And the product worked. Uh, it was, it was, it was a super MVP, so much to the point where we felt like if we added too many users to it, that the whole thing was going to fall apart. <laughs> and so two months after we launched the company, we decided to rewrite the entire app. We're like, this clearly is going to work. We know what it, what it, exactly what it costs us to acquire a customer, which mm -hmm. is very, a very attractive number. Mm -hmm. uh, we clearly know that people want it because people were searching for it. They were loving our ads. They were commenting on, on all of our ads. People were loving the brand. And so we, we took the tough step of almost pausing all new user growth and mm -hmm. saying, we're going to rewrite this thing so we can accept millions of customers. And that ended up being a really good decision instead of sending people into uh, uh, a shaky system. You know, I look at your growth rate, you know, you went from, um, I don't know, you got the first 1 million customers in like nine months or something. And then you got from one to 5 million in nine months. Uh, these are growth rates that, you know, a lot of apps would die to have. You know, most apps, you know, they, they sit on Apple store and don't have any customers. What kind of uh, growth marketing or marketing techniques did you use to get so many users? We were willing to do what major banks were not willing to do. And I think that's why we were able to get such great adoption. Even today, if you look at a, a Chase or Wells Fargo ad, these things are very buttoned up, polished, someone has spent millions of dollars thinking about it, but the general consumer is, is they are so immune to seeing advertising like that at this point. And mm -hmm. so we created this new type of format, which is now quite popular where, you know, it's real people in real formats. Most of our ads are, are shot on phones, or at least it looks like they're shot on phones. Mm -hmm. And being a, one of the first players to, to do that, and definitely the first player to do it in, in the consumer finance industry, we're able to just, scale to the masses because people have never seen a brand do anything like that in such an age old boring industry. You know what I find interesting when you said you were thinking about going to banking and doing this, um, other than, um, well, I guess you had started in the B2C business, but in the, during the all screen days, you, you focus on B2B business, right? Yeah. And of course you never worked in banking, uh, which is a very complex, actually regulated industry. So what made you think I'm going to kick butt in banking? Well, you and every other investor I pitched on the seed round felt the same, <laughs> uh, same thing. Yeah. People, people knew we were good in the, in the advertising industry. So naturally people wanted to fund us to do something else in, in that. But I, you know, I, I'd spent so many years trying to crack the nut on a, on a B2B business. Mm -hmm. that I really wanted nothing to do with building another sales team, at least for the next, for the next company. It's uh, mm -hmm. challenging to, to build sales teams and go to talk to, you know, yeah. I wanted to go direct to the customer. I, and I felt like we had to be incredibly creative and crafty to make it in the advertising business with such a, a small amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I felt like if we could bring that level of creativity and persistence to an age old industry like banking, that we could have our biggest success there because there was no innovation really happening. Yeah. I mean, you talk about um, you know, innovation and uh, being different. Your target market is also very different from the, the target market that big banks usually target or even fintech companies target in the past. I think you call them the bottom 70%, right? Not the wealthy people, but this big, massive group of people, the other 70%, right? Yeah. I mean, it really is the, it's, it's the average American. I mean, everyone wants to be... Mm -hmm. uh, at least an average American. And 
it was our aspiration to build a product that was built for everybody. Mm -hmm. And whether you make $10,000 a year or whether you make $500,000 a year, we wanted to build a great experience for, for that customer. It yeah. just so happens that 90% uh, of the, the people in this country make under $100,000 a year. And mm -hmm. so that to us seemed like the right market to go after. Mm -hmm. And banks weren't thinking about building product for those folks. They were, they were thinking about private clients and how, how much money do we have and getting you into their investment products and major mortgages. But there is a real business in actually helping people um, and it, it, it is certainly one that's novel and we felt like it was largely ignored. Yeah, that's amazing. So going into your specifics of the, of your product, so you offer basically budgeting help. You offer advance of hundred dollars, right? Yep. Uh, side hustle, basically income creation opportunities, which you know, banks should have offered actually. If you think, if you think, think about it, um, allow people to improve their credit scores. And then you ask for a tip based on satisfaction. <laughs> so it, what, what am I, anything I'm missing? I believe that, in, you know, of course our, uh, our, our checking account. So that, that, oh, yeah, is, uh, right. that is really the, the main things there. Yeah. And the question that everybody asks, so how do you make money? Well, what most people don't know on, on banking is that every time you swipe your debit card out there, uh, MasterCard and Visa are getting paid for that. And then they in turn are sharing, uh, sharing that revenue with whoever issued the card. Mm -hmm. And so Dave shipping millions of debit cards, every time somebody swipes their debit card, MasterCard uh, pays us about one and a half percent of that transaction. Mm -hmm. So for every hundred bucks you spend on your card, Dave makes about a dollar fifty. And that, that is the primary way we look to, to drive uh, revenue both now and in the future. Uh, we also make money on the cash advance feature through optional fees like tips. Because we felt like instead of banks who charge you $34, if we let the user pay what they think is fair, that seems like a better proposition. And on average, about 50% of people pay us something. And while um, you know, we weren't expecting to make any fees off that, it's been a really nice business for us to let people pay what they, what they like and it really aligns our interests with, with, uh, with our customers. We also uh, make money from the, our job opportunities. So we market jobs at Uber, Lyft, Instacart, DoorDash, and about 20 other opportunities like work from home. And we get paid sometimes a referral fee on those, but, but not necessarily all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, you know, um, so you, the company's called Dave in part because I think you want to have a different kind of feel, right? And you want to of a very friendly name. Is that, is that, that, that's, that's the reason for the name Dave? Well, it's a, it's a few different reasons. One, mm -hmm. Dave, yes. I mean, it was supposed to be this, this name that you're incredibly familiar with because we mm -hmm. wanted to be this family or friend member in your, in your pocket that's giving you financial advice and is giving you that $50 when you need it as opposed to borrowing from the real version of, of uh, Dave. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the, the initial thinking around it. But also it has a much larger meaning in that we're going up against the big banks and their big fees. So David versus Goliath is really the, the underlying marketing story there of what we're trying to accomplish. Yep. So I know you work also with banks, but do certain banks, you know, directly or indirectly or secretly think of you as a threat maybe? I think they do to, to some extent, although I really do think they're still focused on their, their cream of the crop type customer that's depositing hundreds of thousands of dollars into their, into their bank. Mm -hmm. I still don't think they've quite figured out with their huge bloated cost structure. I mean, Bank of America has 25,000 uh, web developers. They mm -hmm. have tens of thousands of, of bank branches. I mean, these are, this is an expensive company to operate. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who is making under $100,000 a year and going negative on their account, um, you know, their, their ability to make money off those customers comes from charging insane fees. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think to some extent they, they envy our ability to use all these next generation software tools to be a lean shop. I mean, we had 8 million customers with a team of 160 people. That's a far cry from 25,000 people. JP Morgan employs, I think, 300,000 people in this country. It's astounding uh, how many people work at these, these places, though. By virtue, Dave has a, a huge advantage in that 
we don't need to make uh, money by charging extraordinary fees. We can make money by being on the right side of the customer. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm thinking though, you know, if, if, um, if somebody is, is like Dave customer and also let's say a Wells Fargo customer, that customer probably has more loyalty to you than to the bank because all the interesting services come from you. Right? Yeah. So in a way you are capturing the customer more than the bank is. Right. That's right. We're trying to be much more of a, a daily financial habit for hundred million Americans. It's the business and vision that we have. And the only way you're going to create that financial habit is to create products that are helping people that, that they engage with. And that's where our concept of telling you about your upcoming bills that you don't think about telling you the next time you get paid, uh, let you, letting you know how much money you can spend until you get paid next. Those are really crucial things you want to check in on every single day. And we think there's lots of other, way, other ways we can continue to add to those daily products that help people uh, as well. I want to open up the floor for some questions, but I want to ask a couple more. Um, so, you know, you're helping a lot of people that have been sort of uh, neglected by the, uh, the industry. Um, do you see yourself as a social responsible company or do you see yourself as just someone who kind of ended up being uh, what you're doing? Yeah, I, I do fundamentally believe we're a socially responsible company. I think that we have really stuck to that mission of, being a, a helpful and decent company for, for mm -hmm. our, our base. And even from very early on, uh, if users do tip us, uh, mm -hmm. which is completely voluntary, mm -hmm. we partnered with two organizations, trees.org and Feeding America. So every time you tip us, depending on how much you tip, each percentage we plant a, plant a tree or give away a meal to a family in need. And even though we're helping customers who are also uh, in need of funds. It's been an amazing to see the reception of that as Dave has planted 30 million plus trees and given away tens of millions of meals to people in need. So there is a really social uh, responsible uh, side of the business that we feel really good about. That's, uh, that's amazing. You know, um, before I get to the audience, maybe just uh, one last really important question that I wanted to ask you. So, you know, there are very few people who've been successful in four businesses in a row, and uh, you're one of the few people. What do you think allows you to be successful? What do you think helped you be where you are? Well, I think um, <laughs> I think golf was an early one. Just learning how to, you know, no one's going to tell you to go practice. I mean, you're completely on your own to improve your improve your own game. And so, mm -hmm. I think having that self willpower to go. Uh, you know, improve yourself. I think it was a, it's a good first step in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How many hours do you sleep? Do you, do you wake up early or what's your work habit like? I actually get quite a bit of sleep. I go to bed around like 10 or 11 and I wake up around eight or so. And I get actually quite a bit of sleep. That's a lot of sleep, man. <laughs> Generally, I do often wake up around like three or four in the morning and answer some emails and I will go back to bed. Yeah. Um, I do think sleep is, is pretty important. Yeah, so you, don't, um, you don't necessarily work crazy hours. No, I, I don't think that working crazy hours is really what necessarily leads to success. I think mm -hmm. there's, there's something to be said for how working your competitors, but there's also something to be said for having really smart process for, for how you do things. And I think working, working more intelligently uh, and working on the right things mm -hmm. is better than, than burning the, the midnight oil because oftentimes, my best ideas come to me in the middle of the night when I have sleeping. I have this notes app and I'm always taking things that come up. I'll wake up in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. write, write it down. Mm -hmm. And I'll wake up later in the morning and, and see what I, what I wrote. And so it's, um, you just generally in those 13, 14, 15 hour days, the inspiration can sometimes go away as you just start to get exhausted and it becomes counterproductive. Yeah. So productivity, you talked about a couple of times about writing down your ideas. Uh, what do you do well at work? When you're at work, what do you think you do well compared to probably most other entrepreneurs? Is it, is it dealing with people, solving problems? I mean, what is it that you think um, you're probably, probably as good or better than most people? 
I think I've done a really good job. I mean, at least this year, I mean, building out a really quality management team. And even before that, I think really uh, helping to, to uplift the, the team that, that I started the company with, everyone is still intact that we started the, the company with. I, mean, we, I think we all love working together. I think I'm good at building a relationship with, with people that uh, and I'm pretty good at inspiring folks to, to do their best work. Mm -hmm. I generally believe that that's, uh, that's true. Now, trying to you know, motivate 160 people, I'm, I'm learning you know, that side of the, the, the game now as well as uh, you know, building middle management layers and all of that. You know, we're we're going to be several hundred people next year and probably thousands of people in a few years from now. It's, uh, it's a different uh, approach to, to building at this, at this point. Well, well you got a good, good start at it because you're, you're doing well in terms of uh, being recognized as one of the best startup employers. Okay, Darlene, uh, are there any uh, questions that seem interesting or uh, some people want to ask some urgent questions? Yeah, um, sorry, I can't turn on my video. I think I gave Jason my host <laughs> <laughs> features, but that's totally fine. Um, Jason People said that your classmate, um, Cameron, said that you, know, you got rejected and he remembers you getting rejected for your initial dollar per day pixel idea. Um, what advice can you give other students that may experience the same thing with their ideas? Well, I guess rejected how? I mean, from an investor or rejected from what? I'm not quite sure on the details, but maybe we'll focus on the, the second part of, you know, just advice around rejection. I would say generally most investors don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> As, uh, as sad as it is, I mean, when we already had product market fit on, on day, we, we could prove that we had tens of thousands of customers and we were trying to go raise our, our Series A. I took 120 meetings. I mean, investors did not understand what overdraft fees were. These were guys who were coming from wealthy up, upbringings and they thought that this was a, a crazy idea to try and compete in consumer finance to try and disrupt overdraft fees. They thought the big banks were gonna crush us. And so it, you just can't listen to that advice. I think what you have to be willing to do is uh, put yourself in a position that you can continuously work on an idea and work on it in a full-time way that you can really see the idea fully develop. Because in a, in, an in, a, in a world where the smartest people in the world are competing with you to come up with the next great idea, putting a couple hours a day is not gonna be what it's gonna to take to, to get it done. So I truly believe that any idea can be expanded to eventually work. And even though that the first idea may not be the one that investors like, if you stick at it, just like my first, my second company, if you're full time on it, you're gonna figure out different ways to pivot. And if you listen to customers and you talk to people, you're gonna find something that works. Good answer. Darlene, one or two more. Okay, um, people kind of want to know the future of, of Dave and maybe Me too. <laughs> how you're going to yeah, address some of the challenges, maybe some around um, technical challenges or even, you know, data breaches. And um, I know that's kind of ambiguous, but feel free to answer it because there seems to be a lot of questions around. Maybe just the future. What, what do you think of the future of Dave? Yeah. Yeah, the future of Dave, for us, the challenges will be continuously trying to innovate in, in this industry. You know, we, there's a lot of competition. There's 14,000 banks in the United States. And so for us, it is about how do you stay ahead? And we have a, we have a tall order. Now that we've shipped a, a few major product innovations for this industry, we have a lot of copycats. We have a lot of big, big uh, incumbent banks that are watching us closely. And so for us, it's about staying ahead, keeping the pedal to the metal and and hiring the team and staying ahead of the, of the, of the next great thing. I've got plenty of ideas for what, what will be next. Uh, our next product will be a really cool savings account that is unlike something you've seen before. So we're, we're excited about that. And there's also plenty more to come for how we think we can really improve banking in this country. No, when I think about what Dave might look like five years from now, I'm very excited. You know, if you had maybe five, five new products, it'll be so different from anything that exists, right? Yes. So um, I think uh, it's going to be very, very exciting. Yeah, we're excited. Are you testing like different ideas and playing around with uh, different uh, products and stuff? So 
I'm always tinkering. I, I'm still adding things to my idealist, but we also do have uh, an entire user research team now because I, I do believe this goes back to the Y Combinator days that talking to your customers is the most important thing you can do, right. both current and future. And so we have an entire team dedicated to that that's constantly talking to users and, and seeing what they want. And we do lots of brand research and studies to try and figure that out. We ingest all of that data and then really try and come up with what we think it is. Because the one challenge is people don't always know what they want, but it's about taking the feedback and then trying to then morph that into something that's new and creative since uh, folks generally aren't, aren't necessarily going to give you the next great idea. Don't need any uh, other yeah. good ones? Speaking about Y Combinator, uh, what was special about Y Combinator and what did you learn from there? And what would you recommend to someone unable to get into a popular accelerator? So what I learned, again, this goes back to what I said earlier, and that in 2007, 2008, there was no tech scene really in, in LA. And there was no really big angel investors down here in the city. Maybe there were, just I didn't know any. And going up to Y Combinator allowed me to meet all of the great angel investors, meeting everyone from Ron Conway to the Keith Raboys to uh, you name it you were able to, to grab some time with them and talk about their idea. Um, so that, that was a pretty life-changing event for me as it was just really hard to establish that kind of uh, network down here in, in, in the city. Now it's a different, it's a different playing field. I mean, there are lots of uh, investors in LA. I still think Silicon Valley is, is the Mecca, but there are people that are down here willing to invest in, in companies. As far as advice for someone not being able to get into, into Y Combinator, I think there are other ways that you can, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of other incubators now. There's Mucker Labs here in the city. I think, you know, they just had a, a big exit with Honey. And so I think they're gonna be expanding their, their program pretty considerably. Um, you know, I just think there's, there's tons of resources out there. All it takes is one person to let you in. And if you can meet a couple angel investors that can help you fund your, your dream or your idea, that's, that's really all it, uh, all it should take. Speaking of Silicon Valley, I mean, you could have stayed there, but uh, you, you chose to, you know, chose to live in LA. Um, is it mostly personal or what, what, what's the reason you wanted to live in LA? Well, in hindsight, it wasn't the smartest decision. I mean, I think if we, <laughs> st if we stayed up there, I think we would have had a better chance for success. There's still, even though LA is a burgeoning scene, there's still a, a pretty big mantra that, LA does not produce great product and does not have the best product managers. And so we're still pretty early days. Mm -hmm. Now, Snapchat has helped that, although they brought 1,200 people from the Bay Area down to LA to transplant to try and change, change that. Mm -hmm. Honey has done the same thing. Dave is doing, is doing the same thing. So that, that is definitely changing. Mm -hmm. But raising capital and acquiring talent is still, you know, it, it's still to this day is, is, is easier up there. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Uh, advice. Yeah. Um, maybe one more. Yeah. Yeah. What advice do you have for managing a relationship with an investor like Mark Cuban after they've written the initial check? So how do you maintain that relationship? Investors love communication. I mean, catching them by surprise and uh, trying to ask for, for help when there's very little context is tough. And so the way Mark handled with me very early on, even though I don't think he does this still to this day, but he required a weekly update from me. Right. And I had to send him a weekly update for, I think six and a half years he was an investor. So that's a lot of emails that I had to write to him, but he was always plugged into the, the business. He was always able to give advice. He doesn't always write back, but generally he, he would always offer some, some, words of, uh, some words of wisdom. Now he's uh, on our board of directors. And so uh, you know, he, he gets a lot of intel on a monthly basis. Anyways, and he comes to our, our in-person board meeting. So that's, that's uh, been pretty cool. No, I find that to be a good, good rule of thumb uh, to communicate with them often before they ask questions. So <laughs> on, a, on a regular basis, right? Provide yeah. people updates. Even, even a few bullet points is, is helpful for folks to stay involved, at least the ones that, are, that are, uh, have a meaningful check into you. Yeah. What's the hardest thing? I mean, what's the hardest thing about starting and running a company that you find? I think the hardest thing about running the company, well, 
first it was it was raising the, the capital. I mean, it was you know, like I said, it was like a, about a year and 120 meetings to get the the Series A done. Just convincing people this was a, an interesting idea was tough. Yeah. Um, but most recently, you know, the last couple of years, it's really building the, the team. I and mean, people mm -hmm. are the lifeblood of the company. Mm -hmm. And with that comes challenges, recruiting, mm -hmm. making sure you have the right people on the team. You're not always going to hire the right, the right or the best people. And that comes with challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, retaining your best people, hiring a management team, like all the, the people side becomes most of your work uh, as, as, the, um, as the job grows. Yep. And how do you tell if, you know, especially for a mid-level to upper level, uh, executives, how to tell they're they're good? I mean, is this just through interviews, or do you do extensive background check, or what, what do you do? I find myself. I, mean, I do a, a lot of reading. I mean, I'm, I'm reading Harvard Business Review. I'm reading as many books as I can around hiring and management. Mm -hmm. There is a wealth of information about there. Mm -hmm. I also have uh, an executive coach that I use now that I've been working with for the last year, which is very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how do you know? I mean, it begins with a great interviewing process. I mean, rigorous sets of questions that, mm -hmm. and, and an interview schedule that um, you can pass on to multiple people on the team. Mm -hmm. Just understanding how to interview people correctly is, uh, is, a, is a good first start. Mm -hmm. But I will say, if you see things not working out, firing fast is always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good point. Darlene, any more uh Interesting yeah. questions. Yeah, on yeah. that note, so people want to know specifically what are the books that you read or recommend? Oh, interesting. Uh, let me see. What I've got back here. Well, let's see. I mean, measure, measure What Matters is a great book about uh, doing objectives and key results. So that was actually um, written by John Doerr, who was one of the, the founders of Kleiner Perkins. Mm -hmm. And that early, I mean, he, he built that system at Google which effectively helps you measure your quarters and quantify what is important work to get done. Mm -hmm. So effectively most companies in the, in the, the olden days would have major kind of yearly objectives, but this sort of takes those yearly objectives and breaks them down into quarters. Mm -hmm. And then on those quarters, how can you create milestones that are measurable? So if we want to um, launch a new savings goal, there are five things we need to accomplish this quarter, which, which we can measure uh, that, that allows us to know if we hit that goal successfully. So I, I would say that's a, that's a good book to read. Um, on that front of hiring, there's a book called, where is it? Uh, oh, it's called uh, Who, W-H-O, is a, a really great book on interviewing people, which I think, you know, if, if these interview tactics are used on you, it could help you in applying for a job somewhere. But uh, you know, I thought that was a really nice, a really nice overview of, of hiring. I also like to read stories about uh, entrepreneurs. So Richard Branson has a great uh, biography. Sam Walton has a great biography on building Walmart. You know, you start to see how it's not crazy. These ideas these guys came up with, they all started pretty small and uh, were able to create these replicatable models to build these businesses. Not too different than the early speech I heard from that public storage CEO back at LMU, uh, over a decade ago. You know, one of, uh, one of our audience members right now who's a CEO himself asked a question, do you belong to any uh, organizations or networks? Uh, how, how do you network with other people? I'm a pretty bad network, I, networker. I, I you know, pretty much keep to myself most of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm much more of a believer. It's better to know the right people and not every, everyone. And yep. so I've really focused my time on building relationships with some pretty serious key people in my life and develop those relationships versus uh, being someone that I you know, know thousands of people. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jason, this has been an extraordinary 60 minutes. We, I think we packed in a lot of lessons in the last hour. I think this will be a fun, maybe, a, maybe it'll be a classic. Um, I know the business world is very impressed with you. People talk about you all the time. We at LMU are impressed, but also incredibly proud. So I um, want to thank you for joining. Thank you for um, uh, doing this. And I want to 
wish you the best in, um, with Dave and everything else that you do. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a proud alumni. I'm, I'm very thankful of going to Loyola. That'll be my, my, my first and last college I attend, and it uh, was a great experience. Yeah, yeah. All right. Again, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And this concludes, uh, because time is up, the 65th Conrad Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series. For Darlene, me, and the entire entrepreneurship program, and our Dean Dale Smith. I want to thank everybody for joining and have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Bye. Talk more later. Okay. Yeah, of course.